This afternoon we have a, a dynamic wrap-up speaker, but to introduce the dynamic wrap-up speaker, that is not my task. The dynamic wrap-up speaker has a brother. A br I think it's a brother from a different mother or a different mother from another brother. I haven't quite figured this out. They have the same initials, so if you know that the speaker's initials are DB, then who's going to be introducing them? The other DB that we know, which would be Dan Burden. So come on, Dan Burden. Come up and introduce the brother from another mother. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. And it is uh, an incredible uh, opportunity, uh, an honor for me to introduce my brother of another mother, Dan Butner. But I need to explain why he and I both uh, have come up with this catchphrase, so I want to tell a quick story. Uh, back when I was a young, dreaming child, I dreamed one day to bicycle the world. And uh, in time, I was able to bike from Alaska, lead an expedition from Alaska to Argentina. It took three years. And it was published in National Geographic. That was my quest, is to get known uh, to advance bicycling and bicycle adventure. Someone that would read that article uh, then went on uh, to more than complete my journey. Uh, it took us three years, our team, uh, but it took Dan less than a year. He set a Guinness Book of World Records, uh, went on to bicycle all of Africa, all of the Soviet Union. Uh, he is holding three Guinness Book World Records. But what I want to share with this story is that I have now come to realize it's not what we individually accomplish in life, it's who we end up inspiring. Most of the great things I'm seeing that I might have had a hand in playing are now being carried out by the men and women in this room and the many other rooms that we all help populate. So uh, that is why I'm so delighted to be able to introduce Dan because he has gone on to do not just amazing things, first with a bicycle, but with health. And that is the, uh, I want to say, the organizational ability for us to bring all of, our uh, all of our professions together, all of our advocates together. It's the one common theme that's going to resonate. So now I work for Dan. Uh, but I want to give a little more introduction. Wikipedia lists Dan as an explorer, educator, author, producer, storyteller, Emmy Award-winning documentary producer and public speaker. He's all that, but he's also a spectacular health-inducing change agent that can further become the glue that holds us together and a catalytic force that energizes and ignites all of us. Uh, Dan holds uh, not only the three Guinness Book uh, World Records, he is a National Geographic Fellow, and that holds a lot of status. He's a best-selling New York Times best-selling author. He's uh, uh, got three books uh, that are out, all related to health, and now he's working on his fourth. And indeed, uh, before, uh, when he leaves here, he's going to jump on a plane and very soon arrive in Costa Rica to launch into uh, uh, the topic of happiness. And with that, I want to introduce my good brother, Dan Butner. Isn't he the best? Dan, I, I think of Dan as uh, sort of a cross between Johnny Appleseed, Forrest Gump, and the Amadeus Mozart of city design. <laughs> and he, we did indeed bicycle from Alaska to Argentina, which may sound daunting, uh, but what he neglected to tell you was that it was all downhill. <laughs> So we're going to have some fun. And by the way, I know it is Saturday afternoon, and you guys could be out having fun and starting your weekend. Instead, you're here with me, and I cannot thank you enough. I mean that from the bottom of my heart for, for actually staying here. I won't disappoint you. This conference started a few days ago with Ron Sims telling us, truthfully I might add, that our zip code drives our health more than our genes do. So what I'm going to talk about today are the longest-lived, healthiest people in the world and the lessons 
that they teach us about designing our zip codes so that people not only live the longest life, but the best life. And I'm going to get to that, but I want to start with you. I'm a big believer that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So what I'm going to do right now with nine little questions is calculate each and every one of yours life expectancy. And your job, I'm going to ask nine questions. If the question pertains to you, you have to raise your hand. And the hard part, you know, right during nap time on a Saturday afternoon, is remember how many times you raise your hand. So you ready? Questions start easy and then they get hard. Raise your hand if you sleep at least seven and a half hours most nights of the week. At least seven and a half. There we go, a well-rested bunch. This will be an easy one. Raise your hand if you move at least 45 minutes a day, and that could be walking, biking, bowling, running, going to the gym. Should see almost every hand, okay. Uh, raise your hand if you eat at least three honest servings of vegetables every day, and french fries and ketchup do not count. <laughs> three honest servings, okay, about three-fourths of you. Uh, raise your hand if you wake up most mornings, and number one, can articulate your sense of purpose, and number two, you're living it. Uh, when you go to work or play. You live in your sense of purpose. There we go. That's a lot more than I normally see. Uh, raise your hand if you have not, and I underscore not, had unprotected sex with a stranger. <laughs> I love you guys already. I should have been partying with you last night. <laughs> That's a real question, by the way. Raise your hand if you have at least three friends who, number one, you can have a meaningful conversation with. Number two, you can call them on a bad day and they'll actually care. And number three, you actually like them. Three friends. There we go. Almost everyone. Uh, raise your hand if you belong to a faith-based community. Faith-based community. It could be Christian, Muslim, Jewish, doesn't matter. And you actually show up four times a month. Keep your hands up. Okay, there's three hands. All right. <laughs> Uh, easy question. Raise your hand if you've not smoked in the last five years. Not smoked in the last five. There we go. Almost all. And final question. Raise your hand if you have the desire and the capacity, the health, to live to age 90. You actually want to live to 90. Okay, most of you. That's actually the biggest determinant. Uh, if you raise your hand to that one, it's actually the biggest determinant of how uh, long you're going to live. A National Institutes on Aging scientist named Paul Koss has found that uh, Self-assessment of longevity is actually more accurate than anything your doctor uh, can give you because you know three things your doctor doesn't. Number one, you know how you've treated your body up until now. You know how you feel today. And three, you know how you intend to act going forward. Okay, so you're ready to find out how long you're going to live. I wish I had the appropriate music for this. but uh, If you raised your hand at least twice and you're a man, life expectancy 68, and if it's a woman, 71. If you raise your hand five times and you're a man, life expectancy is 77, and if you're a woman, it's 81. And if you raise your hand uh, eight times, at least eight times, and if you're a woman, a man, life expectancy is 88, and a woman is 92. Did anyone raise their hand all nine times? Anyone raise their hand? Okay, could you stand up? Stand up. <laughs> Own it. Can we give him a huge, smart growth round of applause? You're now dismissed to the bar. <laughs> well, well, no wonder why you're injured. <laughs> that explains it. Okay, so Ron Sims was actually right. Something called the Danish Twin Study established that only about 20% of how long the average person lives is dictated by genes. The other 80% is dictated by lifestyle and environment. So about 10 years ago, on assignment for National Geographic and with funding from the National Institutes on Aging, using that assumption, uh, we set out to, in a sense, reverse engineer longevity. I hired three demographers, and we isolated five pockets in the world where people have the highest life expectancy or highest centenarian rate. And once we found these places, we knew it was happening. You knew, we knew that they were getting the good years that most of us want. I recruited a team of experts uh, to join me in these places to help 
uh, tease out what explains longevity in all five of these so-called blue zones. And we boiled it down to nine common denominators, nine quote-unquote secrets to longevity. And I'm going to tell you what those things are. But first, since I have the benefit of National Geographic photography, I'd like to quickly take you to each of the five blue zones. We found our first blue zone about 125 miles off the coast of Italy on the island of Sardinia, a cluster of 14 villages, 42,000 people. And in that blue bullseye there, you have an area where there are 11 times more male centenarians than any place else. And this is a place where guys not only make it to 100, they do so with vitality. At 102, they're still chopping wood, riding their bikes, and beating a guy 65 years younger than them in an arm wrestle. And that, by the way, was at 7 a.m. Uh, after a tumbler of red wine. <laughs> so there. <laughs> so interesting, the longevity ph phenomena, you don't find it among the, the, um, chef, I mean, among the farmers in Sardinia. Uh, the farmers, they tend to work really hard and then they're sedentary. Uh, you find it only among the shepherds. These are people who do regular, low intensity physical activity. They're actually called the lazy boys, sort of wake up late, um, spend a few um, hours with their sheep, they pasture them in the morning, they eat lunch, they take a nap, a couple more hours walking with their animals, and then they're back in the village by five o'clock having a couple glasses of wine with their friends. A few times a month they have to pasture their animals for months at a time. They had to develop a diet that was portable, that wouldn't spoil for weeks at a time. They came up with a type of whole wheat bread called carta de musica, made from whole grain wheat and barley and uh, a type of uh, cheese, pecorino, very high in omega-3 fatty acids made from their own sheep, and then a type of wine ca ca called cananao, homemade. There's nothing like dirty boots to add terroir to, <laughs> to your wine, but um, this wine actually has uh, the highest levels of polyphenols of any known wine in the world, the highest level of artery scrubbing antioxidants, and they drink, the, drink this with, uh, not to get drunk, but fairly regularly. Uh, when they're home there, for most of the last century, they've eaten a fairly pure ver version of the Mediterranean diet. They do eat meat, never beef, occasionally chickens, and pork was a celebratory food after church on Sunday or maybe during a village fest, uh, about five times a month on, on average. Uh, more important than what they ate were their cultural and social norms. Unlike America, where social equity seems to peak at about age 30, here the older you get, the more celebrated you are. And you see 90 and 100 year olds still advising the mayor. They're the ones that have seen the economic downturns, they've seen the famines, they've seen the uh, agricultural disasters, and uh, they possess this wisdom uh, that better ensures the, uh, the survival of the next generation. In fact, something called the grandmother effect has shown uh, that grandparents that live with a family uh, the children in those families, the grandchildren, uh, actually have measurably lower rates of disease, lower rates of mortality, and they do better in school. So they're harnessing older people rather than warehousing them in retirement homes. We found our second blue zone on the other side of the planet, about 800 miles south of uh, Japan, uh, Okinawa, of, of Tokyo, on the island of Okinawa. Uh, longest lived women in the planet. Uh, Women over 50 live about 30 years. There's about 30 times more centenarians among this cohort than you'd see in a similar cohort in America. Once again, it's a culture that eats mostly a plant-based diet. Uh, but what really explains the longevity is not genes, they're heterogeneous population, but again, the way they interact. I asked you that question about Loneliness, if you have three good friends you can count on on a bad day. That's actually the question the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uses to assess loneliness. And if you were not able to raise your hand to that question, you meet the technical definition of loneliness, which shaves about eight years off of your life expectancy. We don't live in a culture that assures we're going to have meaningful friends. But in Okinawa, when you're five years old, you're put in something called a moai, M-O-A-I a committed social network with whom you travel through life. And when things go well, you share it. And when things go south, you have a social support network. I show this picture because these five women have belonged to the same Moai for 97 years. Their average age is 102. 
They still get together every night, drink sake, gossip, and argue about who that hot guy liked best back in 1942. <laughs> but they're also there when, when, uh, when they, each other needs help, either financially or, or health-wise. Uh, no word for retirement in Okinawa. It doesn't exist in their vocabulary, this artificial vocab, um, punctuation between our productive life and our years of repose. Instead, in Okinawa, one word, uh, ikigai, uh, the reason for which I wake up in the morning, uh, imbues their entire adult life. Uh, for this 102-year-old, uh, it was passing down karate. For this 99-year-old, uh, it was uh, uh, fishing and bringing back fish for his families. And for this 102-year-old, uh, even though she was a spiritual leader, it was her great, great, great granddaughter. These two girls are separated by 101 and a half years. And when I asked her what it felt like to hold a descendant more than a century younger than her, she put her head back and said, it feels like leaping into heaven. There's where you want to be at 102. Uh, in America, we found the Blue Zone in a very unusual place off the San Bernardino Freeway. Uh, <laughs> Loma Linda exit, you get off. And remember, I'd just been in exotic Sardinia and Okinawa, and all of a sudden, I get off the freeway, and I see America's Blue Zone, right? And I see on my right a Taco John's, and on my left, a Wiener Hut. And I'm like, what's going on here? Well, it turns out that Loma Linda has the highest percentage of Seventh-day Adventists in the world. Uh, Adventists are conservative Methodists that distinguish themselves from other Christians in that they, they uh, celebrate their uh, Sabbath on Saturday, uh, they evangelize with health. But they've actually done very well. Uh, the government-financed Adventist health study has followed 103,000 Adventists for more than 30 years. So this is a gold standard epidemiology study. Uh, life expectancy for American women right, women right now is 80, but for Adventist women, uh, they're living a lot, about nine years longer, and for men, the difference is even more dramatic. Uh, they're living about 11 years longer. So think about this for a minute. These are people who live out the San Bernardino Freeway next to the Wiener Hut, and they're living a decade longer than the rest of us. Uh, it makes the point that we have the capability as communities. Um, I actually embed it with the Adventists to try to explain uh, what explains these uh, the, uh, extra 10 years. And they do a few things different than the, the most of the rest of us. Number one, um, this day of Sabbath from Friday night until Saturday night, they close down everything and 24 hours, they uh, just slow down. Saturday morning, they go to their religious service. Saturday at lunch, they're doing plant-based potlucks. Uh, Saturday afternoon, hardwired right in their scriptures, they take a nature walk, uh, the definition of which has evolved over the decades, but nevertheless, uh, they're out there getting fresh air and exercise every Saturday. Uh, they take their diet directly from the Bible, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God talks about every plant that bears seed and every tree that bears fruit. So most of them are vegetarian or vegan. And then Adventists tend to hang out with other Adventists, um, showing this well-known adage that uh, you, health-wise you pretty, are, pretty much are who you hang out with. Um, and the contagions that circulate through Adventist networks tend to be positive. Uh, they're exchanging plant-based restaurants they're, uh, or uh, recipes. They're, they're uh, planning their Saturday nature walk. This is a culture that has yielded Ellsworth Wareham, uh, multimillionaire, 95 years old, yet when a contractor wants $6,000 to build a privacy fence, he's like, well, for that kind of money, I'll do it myself. And in 90 degree heat, he's out there shoveling cement. Remember, he's 95 years old, shoveling cement, hauling timbers, and predictably, perhaps, on the third day, fourth day, he ends up in the emergency room, or the operation, uh, operating room. Uh, but not as that open heart patient on the table. That's Ellsworth to the left doing open heart surgery. <laughs> Ed Rawlings, uh, 106 years old. Uh, still an active cowboy, starts his day with a swim, and on the weekends he likes to put on the boards. <laughs> Somehow, by the way, I can imagine Dan Burden looking a lot like this in 30 years. <laughs> in 30 years. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Marge Jatan wakes up every morning. Uh, she uh, reads her Bible. She has oatmeal topped with nuts and soy milk. She's very prescriptive, followed by what she calls a prune juice shooter. <laughs> so imagine that for a second and move it right on out. Gets in her car, uh, barrels down the San Bernardino Freeway, uh, where she still volunteers for the Loma Linda Senior Center, where she helps out the old folks. <laughs> So I wrote up these three cultures uh, for a story for National Geographic. It did well. I wrote a book called The Blue Zones, and uh, that, that did very well. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I had money. And like a good explorer, I immediately turned around and blew the money on more exploration. I hired the demographers that I worked with to write the story to uh, search worldwide census data to find two more blue zones. Um, Counterintuitively, we found a fourth in the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. Uh, this area has the lowest rate of middle-aged mortality in the world. Uh, middle-aged guys have about half the chance of dying of heart attack of the same age in America here, and they achieve that spending about one fifteenth the amount we do on health care. Part of the reason I'm going back there this week to try to uh, untie that knot. And then the fifth blue zone in uh, Ikaria, uh, off the coast of Turkey, it's actually Greek. Uh, largely overlooked by Western civilization, very remote island. By the way, very vertical. These people, uh, fewer than 5% of them own cars traditionally. That's starting to change, as you might expect. Uh, but um, uh, they're up and down hills all day long. They didn't have paved roads until 1970 or electricity. Um, they didn't have ports, so uh, ships more or less left them alone. But they evolved this lifestyle, this culture. Uh, they ate a very pure version of the Mediterranean diet, the purest known version of the Mediterranean diet, uh, included, interestingly, potatoes and uh, beans and about 70 greens that would look to us like the kind of weeds that grew on the side of the highway. Uh, they make delicious pies out of them. Uh, but like Okinawa, older people never think about retiring. They stay active. This 103-year-old priest is still tending to his flock on an ATV. And uh, most of them, like all blue zones, uh, grow gardens. Uh, so um, they're, they may retire, but they really don't ever stop feeling purpose. And by the way, it's not just the simple kind of American notion of living out my purpose and my meaning and my calling. Uh, in these blue zones, purpose seems to be imbued with a certain sense of responsibility, like they owe something to the next generation. And it's a nice sort of yin and yang um, that I believe is a, a, a key component to longevity everywhere. I like to take a, uh, I like to tell the story of this little fellow uh, on the right. His name is Stamitis Moriitis. 22, he comes to America. Hard-working Greek guy, paints houses, gets jobs right away. Marries a Greek-American woman, buys a Chevrolet, moves out in the sub suburbs. American dream. Except the American dream leads to, at age 66, a terminal case of lung cancer. As doctors say, you got six months, get your affairs in order. Well, instead of getting buried in Detroit, he figures, hell, I'll go back to Ikaria, get buried with my ancestors, be a cheap funeral, I'll have more left over for my wife. So he and his wife pack up and they move back to Ikaria, where his parents are still alive. So he moves back in with them. Those of you who have returning college students, you think you have it bad. Starts breathing the air, eating this Mediterranean diet, walks up every Saturday to his uh, Greek Orthodox church. His friends come over on, uh, every afternoon. They drink a little bit of wine. Six months comes and go. He doesn't die. He figures, what the heck? He goes out and plants a garden. Thinking he's never going to be around to, to harvest the garden, but he thinks, you know, my wife will harvest these vegetables and she'll think of me. Well, to make a long story medium, 34 years later, when I met him, at age 102, <laughs> he not only was still growing a garden, he had a vineyard which produced 200 liters of wine every year, all of which he drank. <laughs> and when I asked him what his secret was, he just kind of shrugged and said, I don't know, I guess I just forgot to die. <laughs> which seemed like an unsatisfactory, unsatisfying answer at first, but then I realized, you know what? He was absolutely right. No matter where you go in these blue zones, 
And you see these spry centenarians standing on their heads or water skiing or helping out older folks or younger folks. Uh, it's not because they ever tried. Longevity happened to people in the blue zones. Uh, unlike the way we think of health, this is something we pursue. In blue zones, nobody ever said at age 50, well, go darn it, I'm going to get on that longevity diet and live another 50 years. They never got a Stairmaster or joined a gym or called that 800 number for the supplement. <laughs> longevity was something that ensued. A big paradigm shift in the way we seek health in this country. No matter where you go in the world and you see long live people, the way longevity ensues is like this. Number one, for the most part, they don't exercise. And by the way, exercise has largely been a public health failure in this country. The average American burns fewer than 100 calories a day engaged in exercise. That willful, put it on your outlook calendar and go down and work out. Fewer than 20% of Americans get the recommended amount. It's not working. In blue zones, people are nudged into movement every 20 minutes. They lived in communities where every time they go to work, they go to a friend's house, they go to schools, uh, it occasions a walk. They have gardens out back that they continue to tend until they're in their 90s, hundreds. Their houses are not full of the mechanical conveniences that have engineered physical activity out of our lives. They're still kneading bread by hand or grinding tortillas or doing yard work by hand. They suffer, by the way, from the same stresses that we do. But what they have that we don't are sacred daily rituals that reverse the hurry and the worry and the chronic inflammation that comes from our lives. Blue zones, people pray. They do ancestor veneration. They take naps. They make time for happy hour. They have vocabulary for purpose. Words like ikigai, sense of reason for which I wake up in the morning, or plan de vida. If you can articulate your sense of purpose, it's worth about eight extra years of life expectancy. When it comes to their diet, good news for most of us, uh, they drink a little bit, a couple glasses a day, but no, uh, you can't save up all week long and have 14 on the weekend. Uh, this last book I wrote this year called The Blue Zone Solution, I worked with Harvard's Walter Willett to do a meta-analysis of the uh, food that centenarians were eating most of their lives. If you want to know what a 100-year-old ate to be 100, you can't ask him or her what they had for dinner last night or two weeks ago. They don't remember. We got 155 dietary surveys and more or less did a worldwide average. And I, I don't care what the paleo people tell you, uh, they're eating very, very little meat. Uh, 90 to 100 percent of their dietary intake comes from plants, uh, most of them whole or very lightly processed. Most of that uh, food, 65 percent of it, comes from carbohydrates, not the lollipop kind, the lentil kind. Um, grains, uh, sweet potato, cornerstone of uh, Okinawan diet. This guy's going to run out and get some beans right now and greens, a cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world, beans. They're eating about a cup of beans a day. Uh, I think if America could adopt that practice, it would probably reduce obesity by about 30%. Uh, they do eat some meat, but it's a celebratory food, fewer than five times a month. A little bit of fish, a lot less than I would have thought. Uh, no cow's dairy in any blue zones. You don't see them eating beef or drinking milk. It's a little bit of sheep milk or goat's milk, feta cheese, nuts for snacks, and when it comes to drinking, uh, it's mostly water, six glasses a day, a little tea, good news here, some coffee, and then a little bit of wine at five. Perhaps more important than what they eat is what they don't eat. Uh, they have sacred daily rituals to keep them from overeating. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. Same trend in all five blue zones. The foundation of every longevity culture in the world is how they connect. They tend to put family first, and I don't mean in the sort of politically charged sense of the word, but I mean that they actually keep their aging parents nearby, invest in their kids, make sure they stay with the partner. It's worth two to six extra years of life expectancy. They tend to belong to a faith-based community and show up. That's worth four to 
14 extra years of life expectancy, and they really pay attention to who they're hanging out with. They're either born into the right tribe or they carefully select who they're hanging out with, like in these Moais. We now know that if your three best friends are unhealthy and obese, you're 150% more likely to be overweight yourself. It makes a huge difference who we're spending our Tuesday nights with and our weekends with. So you look at this pyramid, and by the way, the average American could live about an extra 12 years if we optimize our lifestyle. And you might look at this and say, you know, this makes a lot of sense. But how do you get people to do it for long enough so it makes a difference? There's no short-term fix for longevity, by the way. There's nothing on the scientific horizon, no pill, no supplement, no hormone, no genetic thing on the scientific horizon that promises to uh, reverse slow or even uh, or stop aging. Um, the best we can do is preserve ourselves. Uh, we do spend some money on, on um, prevention in this country, about 4% of our, uh, our, our health care budget. And we spend most of that on diets, uh, supplements, and exercise programs. Um, and by the way, they're not a bad idea. It's a good idea to get people thinking about what they're eating, a good idea to get people active. But the problem is all of the, they're expensive, first of all. They sell lots of books. Uh, but they don't really work in the long run. If I get 100 people, if I got 100 of you on the Blue Zone diet today, I would lose 10% of you in just three months. I'd lose 90% of you in nine months, and I would lose almost all of you in two years. Good idea, bad result. Same thing with health clubs and exercise programs. People tend to start them after the holidays with lots of zeal and then run out of gas by September. And even if I'd come home from the blue zones with the pill guaranteed to reverse aging, Americans wouldn't take, take those pills long enough to make a difference. So if that doesn't work, what does? So about 2008, I applied for another National Geographic grant and got it. Renew your subscription, please. <laughs> to look at cultures that were unhealthy to get healthier. And I was starting to think back then, could you, do, could you make a blue zone in America? Could you, rep, could you manufacture one? So I really had to look at areas where um, people are suffering from the diseases of today, and, and, and they reversed. And I, I spent a lot of time with the CEC, and there's all kinds of heart-healthy programs and vitality programs. None of them have worked in this country. They start out, again, lots of zeal for a year or two, but then they go back to their baseline in every case. One place in the world, a non-infectious disease program actually worked. It's in a place called North Karelia, Finland. Uh, 140,000 mostly fairly well-off white people. 1972, they had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease in the world. 55-year-old guys dropping dead of heart attacks. And you take a look around and ask why. Well, they had a dairy-based diet. They used to fry their cheese in butter. North Karelian stew had three ingredients, water, salt, and fatty pork. And if you wanted it spicy, you added more salt. Um, and uh, along came an epidemiologist named Pekka Pushka. And he did just a few simple things. He changed the environment that essentially made uh, uh, unhealthy food more, expes more expensive and made healthier food like fruits and vegetables um, less expensive and more accessible. Simply that. He didn't try to convince people to change their diet. Um, the best example, uh, they love their sausage in North Carolina. It's like bratwurst in Chicago. And there was no way in hell you were going to get people from North Carolina not to eat their sausage. So instead of trying to convince people not to eat their sausage, he goes to the sausage maker, this guy right here, and convinces them to reformulate the sausage so there is 30% less fat and 25% less salt over time. So six months later, uh, people are still buying the same sausage, but it has a lot less of the bad stuff. So that's kind of the general idea. That's the emblematic idea. And inspired by that, and really wanting to manufacture a blue zone, uh, 2009, and by the way, this, this project actually worked. I mean, um, uh, over the course of about 10 years, the cardiovascular disease dropped by 80%. Uh, key cancers dropped by 60%. Uh, there, there, there are articles in the uh, British Journal of Medicine that, that chronicles this very good. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, credible, uh, credible stuff. But I wanted to see if I could uh, replicate it 
uh, in the United States. I got a big grant from AARP and uh, University of Minnesota uh, partnered with us. And the idea here was to take a different approach. And I think this is an approach you guys will like. So you see a little guy there in the middle of the, uh, we call a life radius. We assume that most Americans spend about 80% of their life within about 10 miles of their home or work. Uh, instead of trying to hound that individual or incent the individual or uh, guilt the individual to get off the couch or get moving or eat their veggies, we just kind of say, individual is going to do what the individual is going to do. Individual, we're all, by the way, genetically programmed to crave fat and sugar and be sedentary. We are evolutionarily hardwired that way. And at the end of the day, you can try all these behavioral interventions, but at the end, our genes are going to triumph. So instead of trying to beat the genes, change the environment. So what does that mean? So with this money, I was able to hire a bunch of experts. I hired Nicholas Christakis from Harvard. His expertise is social environments. I hired Brian Wansing from Stanford, now at Cornell Food Labs, a food environment. And I, I brought Dan Burden aboard uh, for the built environment. And we got together and thought about how do you optimize the life radius and do it in a big enough way that it actually makes a difference. So we found five different subdomains, and it turns out the best money, the biggest return on any money spent in trying to get a community healthier is trying to optimize policy. This is according to the CDC. It boils down to things like this. Do you live in a city where smoking is really easy to do or has smoking been denormalized? It's, has it been taxed? Can you smoke, uh, is smoking prohibited indoors and outdoors? Um, is it kind of shunned? Um, do you live in a place where uh, fruits and vegetables are cheapest and most accessible, or do you live in a place where every time you turn around uh, there are fast food restaurants and chips and sodas and no limits on marketing? Do you know if you live in a neighborhood where there are more than six fast food restaurants within a half mile radius, your chance of being obese is 40% greater than if you live in a neighborhood where there are fewer than three? So our approach is change the ordinance so there are only three fast food restaurants or fewer in a half mile radius. Uh, that's our approach. There's a direct correlation between how much junk food marketing, billboards and so forth, there are in a neighborhood and the obesity of the adjacent population. It's well documented. So change the policy. Built environment, huge opportunity. Guess how many Americans have died in automobile accidents? Dan, you can't answer that. Who, what? 30,000 a year, that's pretty close. Uh, actually, in the last century, since the cars came on the scene, automobile accidents have killed more Americans than World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and Desert Storm combined. 3.2 million American lives have been taken by traffic. Uh, it is directly uh, associated with the threefold rise in obesity and the threefold rise in asthma. Yet we never really even think of traffic as something that we address with all these healthcare dollars that we spend in this in this uh, 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 in our world today. We know that if you can just make, and this is not going to be news for you, but according to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that if you just make parks uh, clean and accessible. You have bike lanes, you have sidewalks, you put up some trees, you can raise the physical activity level of the entire population by 30%. You don't have to spend for gym memberships or yoga classes or ab masters. And plus, when you make a community walkable, and I think this is actually the most important, you create an environment where chance encounters between people often become friendships. Uh, I work a lot with Gallup. Gallup sent over two million surveys of Americans over the last five years and found that the happiest Americans are connecting face to face, not Facebook, face to face, six hours a day. How do you do that if you live in a suburb, get in your car, drive to work? Only about 30% of Americans actually like their job. Work for eight hours, get back in your car, get home, make dinner for the kids, and then watch the 4.4 hours of TV the average American watches a day. You're not going to get it. Uh, which leads to the next point, who we hang out with. Huge impact on how long we live. In any city, about 60% of people are ready to make a change. So if you can bring them together, 
uh, in a productive way that will last. You have a uh, strategy uh, for greater health. Uh, the buildings we live in, grocery stores, restaurants, schools, workplace, enormous opportunity. Notice I raise my hand every time it's a big opportunity. That's a cue. <laughs> There are over 115 design tweaks and policies that you can bring to these places we spend our days in to engineer out about 200 calories of needless food eating and engineer in an extra 150 calories of motion. That all adds up. America got obese at 250 extra calories a day. It didn't just happen overnight. And then uh, the other element that we saw very clearly in blue zones but is often overlooked when it comes to building a healthier community is purpose. Helping people find what they're good at, what they like to do, and an outlet for that. We know that volunteers have lower BMI, lower rates of cardiovascular disease, lower, measurably lower health care costs, and altruism is as addictive as sugar and crack cocaine. So this is our blueprint. Can it work? So we got the team together. We auditioned five cities in Minnesota. Uh, in order to become a Blue Zone city, the mayor, the city manager, the head of public health, the superintendent of school, they all have to sign a pledge. They see it, they understand, and they want us to do it. I don't want to spend three days, three years bickering with city council. We're in there, we're going to get something done, orchestrate the perfect storm, uh, hit it in from all sides, and make a difference. Out of five cities that we showed this model to, conservative cities, guess how many applied? All five of them shocked us. This is quite honestly kind of nanny state. I mean, we're essentially asking them to make a commitment contract. Uh, we're going to make your limit your freedom so that the unhealthy uh, decision is a little bit harder. All five applied. We ended up choosing Albert Lee, Minnesota. Eighteen thousand people on the prairies there of southern Minnesota. And Dan was with me shoulder to shoulder. Dan Burden with me shoulder to shoulder the very day we started this thing. And I learned a lot from him that I wouldn't have known. The wrong way to come into a city is to come in pontificating. To come in saying, well, I've been to university for eight years, and I can tell you what you need to do. So that's the best way to get shown the door. Dan Burden comes in with 2,500 uh, uh, towns under his belt, having transformed, and listens. Turns out in every town, every city, there's lots of great initiatives that are trying to get their community healthier, raise the quality of life. But why not just get all feet walking in the same direction? So we made sure to come in with a measurement tool. Remember what I said about measure? If you can't measure, you can't manage it. Uh, we partnered with Gallup, state-of-the-art uh, population measurement tool called the Wellbeing Index. And we measure it so that all these stakeholders can get some credit. They can show their, uh, all the other organizations can show their stakeholders they get some credit. Um, so Dan spent some time with the city planners of Albert Lee. And he found out, you know, they don't, they're not going to spend a bunch more money, but within their budget, turns out there are four beautiful neighborhoods, a beautiful downtown, but there wasn't a vector to get from the neighborhoods downtown by simply connecting 2.5 miles of sidewalks. He created a vector, a safe corridor for every neighborhood to get downtown, a beautiful kind of Mayberry-esque downtown. Then we heard they wanted to widen Main Street. And Dan kind of subtly and diplomatically pointed out, well, you know, widen Main Street, bring more cars in. Parents don't want their kids to go downtown. Those beautiful outdoor restaurants you have, nobody wants to sit next to traffic whizzing by at 50 miles an hour. You can guys go ahead and do that, but let's just put it on the shelf for a year and let's bring in some new ideas. And he noticed, and you'll see in this picture in the upper right-hand corner, there's this beautiful lake at the end of town, but there was no way to get around it. He convinced them to take some of this uh, road widening money and simply put a path around the lake. And guess what? We don't have to lower people's insurance, we don't have to give them a free t-shirt, and that path is full 12 months a year. And it was 20 below zero when I left Minnesota three days ago. Uh, we had a restaurant program where we engineered out, you know, every time you go out to eat, you eat about 300 more calories than you would if you ate at home. Uh, Brian Wansink here, the guy on the right, um, he helped put some nudges and defaults in the restaurant experience. Um, for example, when you come to a Blue Zone restaurant, you don't automatically get bread. You can ask for bread, but we discovered that most people really don't even miss that extra 150 calories of bread and butter, and the restaurant tour saves money. Uh, when you order a sandwich, you, instead of automatically getting fries, you can get the fries, but the default is fruit. 
We change adjectives on menus. Do you know, and this will be useful to all of you, do you know, by the way, the menu, the, the adjective that most assures that people won't order an entree? The healthy choice. Let me tell you something. Nobody wants the damn healthy choice. <laughs> when people go out to eat, they want to eat something good. So you take that healthy salad and you change it to the Italian primavera salad. And sales go up by 30%. You don't touch the price or the ingredients. You just go through the menu. Um, so you can do that system-wide. We got the local grocery store chain to agree to tag Blue Zones Foods, create a checkout aisle uh, with only healthy defaults at the register. We got schools to adopt nine policies so that kids ate less. Uh, rather than tackling the 900-pound gorilla, which is school lunches, change the simple default uh, where there's no, no eating in classrooms and hallways. The BMI of, this, of that whole school goes down by 11% because you cut out eight hours of eating what? Junk food. Then we got about 20% of the population to agree to sign a simple pledge that had them going into their homes. Uh, they, we asked them to uh, calculate how long they're going to live. We have a tool for that, but that also captures uh, citywide data so we know what their BMI is and so forth. Uh, let our experts into their house to optimize their kitchen, get rid of big plates, put in smaller plates, uh, dig a garden outside. These are all uh, small nudges that add up over time. We've got 1,200 Albert Lee uh, citizens to join a MOAI. Uh, we just organize people around potlucks or walking and get them to agree to hang out with each other for at least 10 weeks. Positive contagion, organize a social network around it, and lo and behold, six years later, over 60% of these Moais are still together. It cost us nothing. And then we gave everybody a purpose workshop. We have a guy named Richard Leiter who leads this for us. Spend some time helping them do the internal inventory and then speed date them with volunteer uh, opportunities. <coughs> And uh, in the first month alone, we generated 2,500 hours of volunteering. So after about two years, we checked the results. Life expectancy went up by about 3.2 years. We helped them shed a couple tons of weight. And that was just among the, the uh, survey group. And we helped uh, city workers' health care costs drop by about 40%. And that's really where the rubber hits the road. When you start talking money, people pay attention. And sure enough, uh, Good Morning America came down. USA Today did do two stories, uh, ABC Nightly News, AARP. There was a media flurry because something seemed to work. And what worked was not trying to change people's behavior. Our team looked at everything we did through the lens of, does this make a permanent or semi-permanent change to the environment? So we didn't spend money on the more ephemeral things. And what we discovered after six years, and Albert Lee is still on the program, by the way, um, is that when you change the environment, the culture follows. When people start identifying as a health, living in a healthy place, they start making decisions. They start influencing their policymakers to do more of this sort of thing. It starts this beautiful, virtuous circle. After Albert Lee, our phone started ringing off the hook. 55 other cities applied. We could only do one. We did one confederation in um, Los Angeles, the beach cities, about 150,000 uh, people. Very different culture, but the same strategy. Permanent or semi-permanent change in the environment. Not silver bullet, silver buckshot. Um, so obviously uh, very different. Uh, you know, their problem in LA is they drive to their neighbor's house. Uh, Dan came in, and once again, I always, I always learn something from Dan. Get to know this man. Um, so he taught me that you can present the best policies, the road diets and complete streets, and I'll guarantee you most people's eyes glaze over. They don't know what the hell that means. But Dan comes in, and he takes the mayor and the head of the newspaper and the developers, and he does these walking audits. Uh, and then afterward, he shows them what their town could look like. He does these photomorphs. And once people can visualize it, it's a lot easier to get them to vote for it. Visualize, then the votes come. 
Then he does these great charrettes where after he's shown people what they can do to their town to make it more walkable and bikeable and livable, then he gets all the stakeholders together and has them prioritize what they can do. Uh, what, what do we have the budget for? What do people here really want to do? What do we have the money for? Uh, what can we get done? Instead of hot air, what can we actually get done in three years or five years? Some of our cities are five years. And then our team makes sure that after Dan lights the spark, there's someone there to throw gas on it and to fan it and, and to keep it going. Um, about this time, Dan brought uh, Samantha Thomas in, uh, a brilliant uh, young designer, uh, motivator, uh, and they together designed these uh, mobile study tours uh, to take people from uh, actually any city, but mostly our blue zone cities, to towns that have done it right, to show these planners and these engineers how, what a city can look like when it's planned right. Again, and then to transfer the information, because a lot of this stuff, you can't find the information. It's evolving so quickly. It's got to be a peer-to-peer -peer thing. Um, so Samantha leads that, does a fantastic job. In the Beach City, we help them put in about 200 miles of bike paths. Um, they have this beautiful strand that only went through Manhattan or Mosa Beach. Uh, we uh, help uh, do the machinations so they actually expanded into Redondo Beach. Um, again, making the uh, active choice the, the easier choice. We also convinced them to create a thousand uh, foot perimeter around schools so that there is no junk food uh, and then uh, make the whole place go smoke free. Uh, and after four years, they're now in their fifth year, uh, and this is measured very vigorously, third party, not us. Smoking is down by 30%. BMI is, our healthy behaviors are up by 11%. And what we're most proud of, childhood obesity down by 50%. Thank you for that. I'm actually, that's the, you know, of all this stuff I've done, this is what I'm most proud of. This is a real people's lives, and it was measured rigorously. It wasn't easy. It was five years of steady, relentless pressure, um, steady pressure, relentlessly applied, uh, changing the environment there. Um, from here, <coughs> we got invited by the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan of Iowa to Blue Zone, the pork state. Uh, daunting task, but rather than coming in, and they're very conservative, by the way, we just auditioned 90 cities and picked the 10 that were most ready and did the intervention there. Very easy way to show success and then you, it's easy to pass on when you show neighbors it can be done in your area. And then equally as counterintuitive, the next city that asked us was Fort Worth, Texas, the reddest city of the reddest state uh, in America. Um, Texas Health System brought us in and that again made national news and I think after we uh, demonstrated efficacy uh, here uh, in Cowtown with a plant-based uh, solution, um, we, uh, it, it pretty much exploded from there and uh, we're now in 26 cities. And by the way, starting a, our first Blue Zone city in Oregon here uh, next month in Klamath Falls after a fairly rigorous audition process. So um, I'll be back here in three weeks so for those of you here. I don't have to tell you guys that we have big problems when it comes to health in this country. We spend about $2.2 trillion on largely avoidable diseases. Uh, about 40% of us have prediabetes or diabetes. And for the first time in living history, the life expectancy of our children is expected to be as much as five years lower than our own life expectancy. Think about that for a second. It's not us, it's our kids. Is that because we're stupid or we lack discipline or we love our kids less than our parents loved us? No, it's because our environment has changed in the last half a century. You can't walk through an airport or drive downtown or go buy cough medicine without being routed through a gauntlet of salty snacks and sodas and candy bars. How many of you guys walk to school when you're kids? Raise your hand. How many of you walk to school as kids? Almost every hand. Now, how many of your kids walk to school? Maybe 10 hands. And this is a walkability group. Why is that? We just engineered free uh, three or four hours of physical activity out of our kids' lives. We're a lot like that uh, 
frog in the old science experiment. What did that frog, if you throw a frog in a really hot water, what does the frog do? Jumps out. If you throw a frog in lukewarm water and raise the temperature a degree at a time, the frog will get complacent and you can eventually boil it. I think that's a useful metaphor to what happening, what's happening here in America. It's nobody's fault. Uh, there's no really evil conspiracy. We have just over-innovated when it comes to providing calories, providing ease for our species. And now the same things that uh, got us to where we are, remember we evolved in an environment of scarcity and difficulty, we now live in an environment of ease and abundance. We need to change things. The secret to longevity does not lie with our doctors. Doctors are pretty good at reversing diseases or treating diseases, but not good at keeping us from getting them in the first place. It doesn't lie with the pharmaceutical company. They're there to make money. It doesn't lie with the federal government. I submit to you guys it lies with us. It lies with those of us who have control over zip codes. Those of us who can rally the portfolio of evidence-based ways to make the active option, the healthy option, not only easy, but have the courage to make it unavoidable. I want to end with one last story. Remember Stamitis Moriaitis, that, that old Greek guy who forgot to die? I actually uh, called him uh, a little while ago, and I asked him, um, I was writing about him, and I had some interviews, I had some questions to ask him. Uh, it was early morning in Minneapolis, where I live. It was late afternoon in Icaria. He speaks fluent English. Uh, hit him with a battery of, of um, questions. Uh, and after about a half hour, he said, you've got to hurry this up. i got friends coming over. We're going to drink some wine. I said, just one last question. I said, did you ever figure out how you got rid of lung disease? That's incredibly rare. He says, yeah, yeah, I gave that a lot of thought. In fact, about 15 years ago, I went back to the States to get some tests. And I said, yeah, what would you discover? He said, nothing. I got there, and all my doctors were dead. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>